Good afternoon. We're letting people in, in batches. Here we go, here we go. So welcome everyone, as you first start taking your seats. Welcome, welcome. Come on in, we're delighted to see you. Come on in. So I think I'm gonna launch into my welcome. Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Christina Nosti, and I'm the events director at the independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with author and forester, Peter Goleben, and Dr. Jane Goodall, founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and UN Messenger of Peace, to celebrate the publication of Peter's beautiful new book, The Heartbeat of Trees, embracing our ancient bond with forests and nature to be published by Greystone Books on June 1st with a special early release for today's ticket holders. In our own community of South Florida, practically every event we present is done so in collaboration with Miami Book Fair. And I'd like to thank them for joining forces with us on this very special event. In cities across the nation, independent bookstores are the heartbeat of their communities, and we band together in our own delicate ecosystem of mutual support and admiration. 21 of us have come together today to make this presentation possible, and it's with great joy that I'd like to shout out each one of their names, and feel free to shout back in the chat. Anderson's Bookshop in Naperville, Illinois. Book Passage in Corte Madera and San Francisco. Book People in Austin, Texas. Bookshop Santa Cruz in California. Boulder Bookstore in Colorado. Changing Hands in Tempe, Arizona. Gibson's in Concord, New Hampshire. Harvard Bookstore in Boston, Mass. Left Bank Books in St. Louis, Missouri. Literati in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Maria's Bookshop in Durango. McLean and Eakin in Petoskey, Michigan, Pegasus Books in Berkeley and Oakland, Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., R.J. Julia in Madison, Connecticut, Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, Tattered Cover in Denver, The King's English in Salt Lake City, University Bookstore in West Lafayette, Indiana, and Village Books in Bellingham. Thank you for all you do. Our moderator for this afternoon's program is Donna Seaman. Donna is editor for Adult Books for Book List. She's also a member of the content leadership team for the American Writers Museum and a recipient of the Studs Terkel Humanities Service Award and the Lewis Shores Award for Excellence in Book Reviewing. Her author interviews are collected in Writers on the Air, Conversations About Books, and she's the author of Identity Unknown, rediscovering seven American women artists. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Donna and turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you everyone who's joining us today. This is an amazing event. Thank you for your support of books, independent bookstores and forests. I am so pleased to have the honor of introducing world renowned ethologist and conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall a lifelong hero to so many of us. Over 60 years ago, Jane Goodall first set foot onto the shores of what is today's Tanzania's Gambi National Park to begin her pioneering chimpanzee behavioral study. In the last six decades, this research has transformed scientific perceptions of the relationship between humans and other animals with her mission evolving into a quest to empower others to make the world a better place for all living things. In 1997, Dr. Goodall established the Jane Goodall Institute, a global leader in innovative conservation approaches that better the lives of local people living around chimpanzee habitat. Today, the Institute operates with 30 global offices, supporting the research at Gandhi, in addition to innovative community-centered conservation projects. Chimpanzees Sanctuaries in Africa and the Institute's International Youth Program 
Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Goodall has been traveling nearly 300 days a year on a perpetual world tour, speaking um, and can now, sorry, a perpetual world speaking tour and can now be found giving virtual talks shared across the globe from her childhood home in Bournemouth, England. Jane Goodall is a United Nations Messenger of Peace and Dame of the British Empire. Her many awards and honors are simply too numerous to list. It brings me great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Jane Goodall. I am also thrilled today to be introducing Peter Volaben. Peter is a forester and the author of numerous books about the natural world, including the New York Times bestseller, The Hidden Life of Trees, and its follow-ups, The Inner Lives of Animals and the Secret Wisdom of Nature. Peter has also written numerous books for children inspired by his work teaching school groups about the forest, including Can You Hear the Trees Talking? Peter and the Tree Children, and Do You Know Where the Animals Live? When he's not writing books, Peter runs an environmentally friendly woodland near German's Eiffel Mountain, where he's working for the return of primeval forests. He also founded and runs the Forest Academy, which supports worldwide initiatives to protect forests, including EcoAsia, an ecological search engine that uses its profits to plant trees around the world. The Forest Academy also supports scientific research projects, including research into the signal transmission of the tree brain, or in other words, the root tip. In 2020, Peter delivered the keynote address at the International Conference for Biodiversity and Climate. Peter's newest spectacular book is The Heartbeat of Trees, Embracing Our Ancient Bond with Forests and Nature. Congratulations on your new book and welcome, Peter. So I hope that, um, oh, there you are. Hello, Dr. Jane. Hello. I wanna start with a question for you, if that's all right. Um, as you write at the start of your book, Seeds of Hope, Wisdom and Wonder from the World of Plants, your passion for plants and trees blossomed when you were a young girl exploring the English countryside near your home where I believe you are today. I'm struck by how entwined your burgeoning love for nature was with your ardor for reading and for writing. I wonder if you could talk about that connection. Well, the thing is that um, I was actually born loving animals. People say, where did that begin? Well, it must have begun in my mother's womb, I think, because I popped out and right from the beginning, I mean, I know this from stories my mother told me about how I was fascinated by animals, but it, it wasn't only animals, it was trees as well. And as I grew older, and you're right, I'm speaking from the house where I grew up from the age of five onwards. Um, that was when World War II began. And mom, me and my sister came here. And uh, so I look out of the window and I can see the trees I climbed as a child. And there's one special tree. I called him Beach. And I used to spend hours up there being close to the birds and nature. And I actually got my grandmother, I wrote out her will <laughs> and got her to sign it, which of course isn't legal, but in that will, she deeded Beach to me after she died. And Beach is now a very big tree, I couldn't climb him anymore, but I have lunch under him every single day. And this love of animals and trees and plants took me all the way to Africa. So I spent my life uh, a great, a great deal of my early life out in the forests of Gombe National Park, understanding from the rainforest how everything is interconnected and every little species has a role to play. Indeed. Oh, thank you for that. Peter, I think you had a rather different path towards your love for nature. You're, yeah. Oh, just a moment, my microphone. Um, <laughs> didn't start it with trees. I, I really don't know how it, how it started because um, I, I loved, yeah, from, from the very first moment on, I loved nature, but in, within my family, I was uh, something like the green sheep. <laughs> because, yeah, my, my, my sisters, my brother, they, they work uh, on different things. They are not so interested. And uh, as a child, 
I, for, for example, I hatched a cake, which I named Robin Hood, um, on my, my grandma's heating pad because I wanted to recreate Conrad Lorenz um, experiments. Um, he had done some, some uh, research on gray bees and found out that if you talk to a chick that is still in the egg, um, it will late, later think um, you are its mother. And it worked. <laughs> However, it was only fun for a few days. And then it became very exhausting um, because this little ball of fluff always wants to be with you, always making beep, 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 beep. And um, I still had to, to make my homework for school. And, uh, and I had to be very careful not to step on it. And later, Robin Hood was adopted by my English teacher and became very old, sitting on his shoulder and uh, marching through, through the village and uh, thought it was human. <laughs> and that was, was how it began. And um, after school, I, I uh, thought about studying biology, but then I chose forestry because I thought uh, forester is something like a tree keeper, which turned out to be a mistake. Interesting. Um, you both became seasoned practitioners of what I would call the art of attention. And I'm, I think this is so essential. And I think we all need to practice this, especially when it comes to the living world. I wonder if you could talk about the attention, the importance of observation and, and careful attention. Jane? Well, the thing is, you know, I, I dreamed of going to Africa from the age of 10 onwards. And I read Dr. Doolittle and then Tarzan. And of course, I fell passionately in love with this glorious Lord of the Forest and was very jealous when he married the wrong Jane. But <laughs> that's when my dream began. I would go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. I and mean, girls weren't scientists in those days. So eventually, because of the support of my mother, everybody else laughed at me. You can't do that. You're a girl. Africa's far away. You don't have money. No, we didn't have money. But my mother always said, if you really want to do this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of all opportunity. If you don't give up, maybe you find a way. So never mind about how it all happened. But I got there. I met Dr. Lewis Leakey. He gave me the opportunity to study chimpanzees. And it was out in the rainforest in Gombe National Park that I understood about the the amazing tapestry of life and how in what we call an ecosystem, which can be a forest or a wetland or a prairie or whatever, it's made up of this fascinating tapestry of life where every species of plant and animal has a role to play. And this is the big problem that we face today. We are destroying that tapestry. Each time a species becomes extinct, it's like pulling out of a thread. And then when that tapestry becomes tattered, the ecosystem collapses. And we are part of the natural world and we depend upon it, but we depend upon healthy ecosystems and they're vanishing. Yes. As we speak. And Peter, that's what you found as a forester, that instead of looking at forests as a living entity, as a community, um, that every species helps every other species, uh, not that there aren't predators, but that you're all part of a web. Instead, they were looking at trees as commodities. Exactly. Um, um, the, the mistake I, I spoke about was um, that foresters are in reality something like a tree butcher. And uh, we were taught at university that this is right because the forest needs this treatment because otherwise it gets too old and just the young trees are healthy and can withstand climate change and so on um, which is still taught today at universities and uh, when i began to practice as a forester um, i felt in my heart that something uh, was wrong but i didn't know what because i was taught this is okay and we are something like forest angels by cutting trees <clears throat> and um yeah, but I, but I felt from the very first, first moment that this is not right. And then I started to travel around and uh, looked, uh, visited people who uh, treated forest much more carefully. And I learned from them, not from, from uh, university. And uh, then I found out, ah, my feelings are right. I trusted myself again. Yeah, that, that was really hard for me. And because from that time on, I worked against 
other foresters, not because I was fighting them, but they, they won't uh, let me do my job because it was also financially more successful because a healthy forest is also a, a forest um, which which is which uh, which you get more money from more jobs um, you, and we were not just looking after timber but we were looking for tourists and say okay you can experience this forest by spending a night in this forest make a guided tour and and keep this natural cathedral and not uh, tear it down and um, and I changed my my view on forest together with the people I guided through the forest because they discovered the wonders and I was just used to to judge a tree as oh it's good for the sawmill because it it's straight and without big branches and so on and the people say ah no look at this tree it's bended like my way of life and I thought no this tree is worthless and then yeah, it, it seems crazy for for now but at uh, this time it was really hard for me to go back to to my thinking uh, when i was a child and i think yeah it, it took some years but i'm really happy that now for let's say 20 20 years i have the better look on forest and can really have forest you know peter peter i think that your your interaction with um the establishment, let's call it the scientific establishment, was very much like mine. So when I went out to study the chimpanzees, I had not been to college because we couldn't afford it. And Leakey, I was lucky, Leakey chose me, A, because I was a female and he thought that women might have more patience out in the field observing. And secondly, because uh, maybe uh, that, th because I know so secondly because I hadn't been to university so I wouldn't have been brainwashed by the then very reductionist scientific way of thinking of the animal behaviors that's in the early 60s so I was in Gombe for one and a half years and then Leakey tells me I have to get a, a degree and there's no time for a bachelor's degree so you can imagine I get to Cambridge University in the UK to do a PhD in ethology, well, I didn't know what ethology was. I mean, there was no, you couldn't Google anything in those days. There was no email, it was letters back and forth. Anyway, okay, animal behavior. And I was told I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about their personalities, minds or emotions. Those were unique to us. But my dog taught me as a child that the professors in this respect were wrong. And my mother had taught me have the courage of my conviction if I listened to the people who thought differently and still felt I was right. So I didn't confront them. I just quietly went on describing what I saw. And my then husband did documentary films. So science had to change. Science had to admit that we are not the only beings on the planet with personality, mind and feeling. And now, you see people like you come along. So as we gradually begin to understand the amazing intelligence, adaptability, sentience of other animals, people like you are coming along and giving the same respect to the forest, to the trees, which I've always loved. And this is why I am really enjoying this conversation with you because it brings together everything I've always loved with, with some actual proof, like what you're talking about. I love it. Yes, exactly. And um, Peter, why don't you tell us some of the wonders in the heartbeat of trees? For instance, what is the heartbeat? Yeah, that's a good question because um, up to now, no one can really explain how a tree brings the water from the roots to the tip, to the top of the tree. Um, some in maximum 140 meters. Um, there are many, many explanations. For example, even scientists up to date tell me that it is the transpiration from the leaves. The, 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 the water gets gases out of the leaves and that causes under pressure and the water rises up in the stem with the under pressure. But that's not possible because the highest pressure of water in a stem is in springtime 
before the new leaves come out. So uh, that, that explanation, um, it, it is not true. And I love scientists like Jane um, who are curious. And for example, we have uh, those three scientists from Hungary, um, Finland and Austria who um, try to discover the sleeping behavior of trees. That sounds crazy, but, but they made it really cool with lasers and they measured the trees uh, in, in um, nights without wind. And then they found out that the trees that hang their branches just a little bit, although the water pressure is rising at nighttime where the branches should go up, but they go down and uh, when with sunrise, they go up again. We don't know why, but to be honest, we don't or we don't know up to date what sleep, what our sleep really is. We know <laughs> some things, but we don't know really what it, what it is about. And we don't know what trees are doing while they are sleeping, but they change their behavior. And why, while observing this, they found out that the, that the trunk is shrinking just a little bit within two, uh, three or four hours um, and then um, they expanding a little bit, just around about 0 0.05 millimeters, just a very little bit. You can overlook this very easily. And um, of course, because trees are so slowly, but there is a guess that this may be the heartbeat of trees. And I love this discovery. <laughs> Peter, I, I have to come in here because when I was first at Gombe, I was spending an awful lot of time alone. You know, I first went with my mother because I wasn't allowed to go alone and she volunteered to come. But then I was alone and I started, I was talking to the trees and I got to know the trees as individuals. And, you know, there were the great old ones and which I discovered later were kind of um, uh, sort of like science, uh, like, like spiritual goals for the people who lived then. But I would come up to this young sapling and it had this smooth bark and I put my cheek against it and it just felt like I could feel the sap rising. So I had this amazing relationship with cheese right from the beginning and lying under the, on the forest floor and looking up at the dancing specks of light through the canopy. There's a magic, isn't there, about trees? I mean, it's not just science. It's more than just science. It's what the world is all about. It's, it's, it's something science will probably never ever be able to totally discover. There's always going to be a mystery. And that's wonderful, I think. Yeah, I love your words, Jane, um, because um, in the moment, many scientists uh, says that trees serve us as um, um, a deposit for CO2, that they serve us for cooling the climate, they, that they serve us for, and so on, and so on. But their trees are wonderful. And they, they if you could ask a tree, they, 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 a tree would say, what? I do what? For, for who? No. And perhaps they don't even know us because uh, trees are really very, very slow. They love the, 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 the time scale. Trees are here on this little planet since 300 million years. We are here since around about 300,000 years and just to say foresters are on this little planet uh, since 300 years. So we have to learn a lot and perhaps we have to be very careful with those slowly beings. Yeah, I, it, really, it really upsets me to talk about the services the forests give us. I mean, they're there. <laughs> they're, they're there for themselves. They're not there for us. We yeah. make use of it. And then we turn them into commodities. They're there for us. You know, God gave man dominion over the birds of the air, but also the forests. But they're not there for us. We just benefit from them. And we should be worshipping them like they used to in the old days, not taking for granted that they're there to give us their services of fresh air, fresh water, mitigating climate change by regulating temperatures, rainfall, and so on. I, I get really upset because the forest to me is a living, breathing, it, it's, it's something that's so special. And trees are so gentle. And um, forests love the stories that trees fight against each other. And I haven't seen any tree fighting another tree. They No, they, they cooperate. They cooperate because trees know instinctively that just as the forest, as a community, they are able to survive. They are able to create their own climate. 
from which we benefit, but they do, don't do it for us. You are completely right. They do it for themselves because they love it cool. They love it humid. They love a lot of rain, even here in Europe. Um, and they do it for themselves and as a community and they don't fight each other. And uh, foresters love the story that trees fight against each other because then they can be the referee with the chainsaw and say, okay, you, you have to go. And by the way, we have timber. And that's not right. This I don't love this story. No, no do I. <laughs> you know, Peter, you write so beautifully about how we evolved as, really as part of the forest, that all our senses are, are cued to the forest and to our surroundings um, because we came so much later. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and, and why we feel, as Jane described, so elated and, and even spiritual in, in the presence of trees should answer first? Yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, we wouldn't have um, developed as humans without forests. Uh, for example, our brain is as big as it is because our ancestors started to cook meals and therefore you need wood and therefore you need, you need trees, of course. And uh, we know that, for example, we, we, are, um, we have special senses for fire smoke most people, when it, it's not so strong, love, love the uh, smell of, of smoke. Um, and I love even more the, the latest discoveries that our blood pressure sinks in intact forests. And there's a difference between plantations and intact forests. Our blood pressure sinks. I've, I've uh, tried that with a, a German TV host um, in, in the city of Cologne, a big city in Germany, and then outside in the forest. And there was a big difference in the blood pressure your human system gets stronger. And um, we think, ah, when we go out in the forest, uh, our body is reacting, but it's uh, the other way around. When we are in a city, we have problems with our body and that because the blood pressure is rising and our human, human, system, human system is getting worse. So it's the, uh, the other way around. And when we go back into the forest, we don't go out in the forest, we go back in the forest because that's our real home. And there we feel comfortable and our body is, is telling us and um, we are, uh, and most people are not aware of that, but they, are, they, they say, and that's the translation for our mind, they say, wow, it's a nice place. I'm relaxing. And that's exactly the uh, reaction on intact forest. And you know, Peter, it, it's, even even individual trees are helping us. I mean, there's all these experiments that have been done where you take a, a, an inner city area of high crime and one part of that city you fill with trees and flowers and shrubs and things and the other part you leave. And it turns out that the crime rate drops. And when you get a city which is filled as much as you can with green trees and parks and and even little tiny patches of forest, then, as you say, it, it alters our physiology and blood, blood pressure uh, decreases and we become calmer. And the cost of medical care for people drops because they're feeling not only physically but mentally healthy because of the trees. Yeah, I, lo I love to hear that. Um... Um, in Germany, I don't know how, how it is in England or in the United States or Canada, but in Germany, the most officials fear trees where branches break down because then they, have, they are responsible for injuries. And that, therefore, they, every year there's a massacre in German cities and cutting down trees or pruning them very hard um, just because they think trees get safer afterwards. But no, trees get weaker afterwards because when you cut a thick branch, then part of the root system dies and the trees, tree gets more instable afterwards. And we know that the lifespan is more than a year longer with, the, as you said, Jane, uh, in, in cities with a lot of trees than in cities without or just a few trees. And um, the risk of getting hit by a breaking branch is, I think, around about 10,000 times or even more less then uh, the lifespan you, you, you um, gain. So it's crazy, but, but with fear, you can do everything. And uh, German authorities are full of fear because they don't like to be responsible for something. And therefore we see this tree massacres. And what I love 
this, um, I think we, in Germany, I don't know if we heard that the high court uh, said to the German government that they sh have to do more um, to fight climate change. And I hope that we get more traffic out of the cities, get more space for trees and cities so that more nature can come back into to the people. And it's so jolly important and, you know, bringing nature back wherever we can, bringing trees back wherever we can. So planting trees is important, restoring forests, like allowing the forest to recolonate the areas that have been destroyed naturally, like the seeds in the ground can sprout up, even some tree roots, right? Um, but also, I, I think you would agree that number one important thing is protecting our old growth or as old growth as we can, as we can have forests, protecting the real, real forest. Isn't that the most important thing? That is the most important thing, and you're right, um, that we need the combination. Stop clear cutting old growth forest or old forest, as you said, because in Germany, for example, we don't have one square meter left of old growth forest, but we have old forest. Yeah. And as, as soon as you release them into the, the freedom, um, uh, it's wilderness, and I love this. Then it's wilderness. Wilderness is, is the opposite of cultivated land, and um, and we need new forest, planted trees on land, which is um, used for meat production. We need less meat consumption, and therefore we can gain more forests. And I think that this message is also very important. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Move towards a plant-based diet. That's one of the most important things that we can do if we care about the future of the planet to fight climate change. And, um, you know, fortunately, the, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, they have also realized that this passion for eating more and more meat, milk and eggs is destroying the environment. It's not only very cruel, it's bad for our health too. Jane, I wonder if you could talk about um, your work in Gandhi with um, community-based preservation of forests, you know, the understanding that, you know, sometimes forests are cut because people need the resources, but then that undermines their future. Um, and if you can talk about how people are part of the ecosystem and, and need to be helped as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, after I helped to organize a conference in 1986 to discuss why chimpanzees and forests were disappearing in Africa, the problems faced by the chimps. And I managed to get to six African countries. And I learned a lot about the problems faced by the chimps, but I also learned a lot about the problems faced by humans living in and around forests. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park. When I began work there in 1960, it was part of what we call the equatorial forest belt that stretched right across to the West African coast. Gombe's about in the middle. But by the late 80s, when I flew over in a small plane, I was shocked to see that Gombe was now a tiny isolated island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills with more people there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere struggling to survive, cutting down trees, even on the very steep slopes, because Gombe is a series of valleys running down from the rift escarpment to Lake Tanganyika. And they were desperate to feed themselves and their families or to make charcoal. And this is when it hit me. If we don't help these people to find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps, forests or anything else. And so we began our Jane Goodall Institute method of community-based conservation, which we call Take Care or Tukari, as it's known. It's a very holistic program. I won't go into it, but it, it does include uh, restoration of the forest and training through workshops, people from now 104 villages throughout the Chimp Range in Tanzania uh, how to monitor the health of their forests. They've learned how to use smartphones. They go into the forest, they, they record and photograph an illegally cut tree or an animal trap, or on the other hand, a chimpanzee nest or something like that. And they're very proud. This all gets uploaded 
to a platform in the clouds called Global Forest Watch. And it's transparent. Everybody can see what's happening. And it's now in six other African countries, this Takari program. And these people who were resentful of arrogant white people coming in and telling them what to do. We didn't do that. We chose local people to go into the villages and ask them what they thought we could do. And so now these people have become our partners in conservation, understanding that protecting the environment isn't just about wildlife, it's about their own future. And by helping them find ways of living without destroying the trees, they're, as I say, they've become our partners in conservation. It's so important and, and so beautiful. And I, I wonder, Peter, are there other forest um, restoration and rewilding efforts that also involve local people? Germany or? Any, anywhere that you know about. <laughs> um, yeah, all over the world uh, this happens, but um, it's very important, as Jane said, that it's for the local people. In the moment, uh, many, Many uh, organizations and uh, enterprises try to, to um, reduce their carbon footprint by uh, reforestations in foreign, let's say, southern countries. And um, that is a sort of land grabbing when it's without the local people. Um, and uh, the, the biggest problems, uh, to be honest, we have an, uh, right on our front door. In Germany, for example, we have 0.6% wilderness. <laughs> that's, that's really not, not very much. And uh, and the old, very old forest that we hear uh, that we have here in Germany, they they are uh, very hard um, used for timber productions. Although the, we have just a few left, so so I would say uh, we need uh, everywhere in the world, but but mostly in the, in the in the rich countries. Uh, initiatives, because when they do it in their own country, then the people in poorer countries believe us that we are, that we are honest. And uh, because when we, we just protect nature in other countries, not in our front door, uh, then yeah, then they don't trust us. And um, I can understand that very well. So we need the combination of, of all together. And that is the experience I made. Um, during my travels to, to endangered forests and endangered people, um, that all over the world, the people know, the, the, the indigenous people know how to use their forest. It, uh, it always goes wrong um, when, it, when it comes to the, the typical, um, yeah, let's say capitalistic world that we have nowadays, uh, that you have to earn as much money as possible, and then the system breaks down. And uh, when I see what I what I love most is the example from the traditional indigenous forest use, British Columbia, this little um, First Nation, uh, the Quaker First Nation. Um, they have trees in the forest which were used by their ancestors um, 150 years ago. And when they need a plank, they cut it out of the tree and let the tree live. Okay, that harms the tree, of course. We know that the trees may, may feel it, but they, they wouldn't cut the tree. They just cut a plank out. And, and nowadays, those trees are monuments and the rest of the forest is clear cut by, by forest companies. So that's a different use. And, and I think we should go back to a traditional forest use. I'm not against the use of forest. I love timber, I love a wooden chair, I love books, of course. And books are made <laughs> of shredded tree bones. <laughs> it's okay for me, but it's as long as we left, uh, let for other beings enough room to live their own life. And I think we need a better, a better balance. And Peter, I know that you take children out into the forest. Don't you agree that working with the new generations, helping them to understand, helping them to reconnect with nature, helping them to understand that we need the natural world for ourselves and to love it and respect it. Because all of these dire problems we face now, including the pandemic, but climate change, loss of biodiversity, it's all because of our disrespect of nature, not only forests, but forests as well. 
So working with young people from the youngest possible age, you know, it's one of the things that motivates me. It's our Jane Goodall Institute Roots and Shoots program. It's now, it's, it's growing in Germany. It's in 67 countries around the world. And it's about young people getting together to make the world a better place. People, animals, environment, because we're all interconnected. It's no good just working with one of those. It, we, need to, we need to encompass the whole lot, don't we? You're completely right and and you have also written books for children as i have and uh working with children is a lot of fun because they are easier they ask the better questions yes. uh, which which adults don't allow themselves to ask yes, uh, right. and, and yeah it's 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 always a pleasure to discuss with children and they are so aware of the problems but also uh, aware of the wonders um sometimes when when i go out with families in the forest it takes a little time until the adults slow down because when when children are exploring the soil for example which is really um a, a big adventure to all these little animals creeping around there and then sometimes the parents say okay hurry up we have to walk uh we have to, to go another let's say five kilometers uh to the next restaurant they say no please <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, calm down, uh, let the children uh, explore. And, and if there is the only place for this day, it's okay. Then it's not a hike, it's a discovery. And, I, and so I, I love to work uh, with children and therefore um, I encourage children even in cities to explore the nature of cities because in, in every city, there are much more animals than people. It's, the cities are in reality a, a strange, the strange uh, mountain with, with uh, cubic rocks for <laughs> animals with people living in the rocks. <laughs> it's yeah. just other side on cities. So Peter, we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate with what you're doing and our roots and shoots. And the more we get together and the more we collaborate, the better we change the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And we, we tried that, uh, tried this. The audience don't know that uh, last year, but the COVID-19 pand pandemic, uh, destroyed our plans to to meet but uh, i hope in the, in the near future we are going to to make it because we we have to connect much more there are so many people out there um, who are working together for a better future and that's what i love on on your books and, and your attitude you're an optimist and we need more optimists because the future can be really really good um, when as soon as we stop the destruction of nature nature is still very strong but I think we, we don't uh, have to go too far with what we are doing. I think it's now time for recreation for nature and we can um, participate because it brings so much happiness in our life. Yeah, I completely agree. And this rewilding program that's sweeping across all these different European countries, it's magical, it's wonderful. And you know, like you say, give nature a chance and nature will reclaim a place that we've destroyed. And it will never be quite the same as originally, but it doesn't matter. Nature will come back. Biodiversity will come back. We'll start off with the plants and the little tiny creatures in the soil. And then eventually you'll have a vibrant tapestry of life in that place. That's what's so exciting. And I get so upset. The media gives us only doom and gloom, and we need to know what's happening. But we need to give equal space to the amazing people, the wonderful projects, all the things that are happening to reclaim what we've destroyed and make it once again beautiful and health giving for us and for the land and for future generations. Do you think that the pandemic, in spite of all its tragedies, by having so many of us stay home and pay more attention to our surroundings, to take walks because we couldn't gather and do the usual things that we did to get together has awakened a little more ecological awareness among people. Have you noticed that at all? Peter, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. So um, uh, I'm, I was really, I was not happy about the, the pandemic, but I was happy that, the peop that more people went out into nature because it was the only space which was open. And, uh, right. Uh, even here in, in, in the Eiffel Mountains in Western Germany, usually you, you don't see any any person the whole day long when you're hiking here. And now perhaps 
two times. That's a lot more for, for us here. But uh, when, with every person I saw, I was happy. And I encourage people to go, go out in the forest. It don't disturb uh, the, the animals uh, when you when you are out in the forest. Even children, which which are shouting loud and playing, and the parents say, "Ah, oh, be silent." No, um, most animals are afraid of hunters, but that's a difference. Hunters and children are really different. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the animals in, in the first uh, by first sight, they don't know um, is it a hunter or is it just a child or a family. And as, as long as you are relaxed, it's like the big predators um, in, in the tropical zones. Uh, when a, a, pre a predator shows itself and say, oh, I'm relaxed, I'm not on a hunt. Then the, the animal animals uh, surrounding relaxes. And it's exactly here in our forest, the animals are very shy as long as they don't know if you're a hunter or not. And uh, when people go out and relax and, and talk together, then the, then the animals relax too. And I love that, that the people get aware that they are part of nature. As, as you say, uh, Jane, with the, all those doom news, uh, we, we say, ah, here we are as humans and there is nature. No, there is no difference. And we are not in, on this side and nature is on the other side. We are all on the same side and we are so interconnected. We are also nature. For example, you have, I think on, on your hands, you have 150 bacteria species and they from one hand to another they differ just uh, about uh, I think they differ around about 80 percent so your left hand is a different cosmos than your right hand and even if you rub your hands or wash your hands after some minutes the, the cosmos is reinstalled so that are like little planets just your hands and uh, so we we the, the, we are part of the world and um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic showed us that we are still part of the, even the virus world, which we thought uh, was overcome. Uh, and uh, as, as we know, that's really silly to, and stupid to say that we are above nature and that we control nature. No, no, nature is controlling us. Think about the air, about the water, about nutrition. Um, that's all depending on plants. And when we, we uh, depend on, on uh, the generous uh, grow of plants, which allow us to live on, uh, on their benefits. So uh, we are not above, we, we should. I um, talked about um, a um, philosoph, philosoph, and uh, he said uh, that when, when we have a ranking in nature, then the plants should rank on place one, because all the, all, all the life is depending on them. Indeed. Well, we only have a few minutes left. So Jane, I just want to ask you about hope. Hope is your word. You have a hope cast. You have a new book coming out, the book of hope. As you said, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but what do you, where do you find hope and how do, how do you share hope? Well, my hope lies in the young people. They are, as we speak, changing the world. Once you, I mean, our Roots and Shoots program, I think, grows so fast because it allows the young people to choose their projects. It's not, it's a bottom up, not top down. And so they get together and they talk. It's, it's uh, very democratic. They choose what to do. And then because they're allowed to choose, they're very passionate. So they roll up the sleeves and get out there to take action. It's all about taking action. And as I say, it's all around the world now. And also, as we began in 91, we got all what I call the alumni. They take their values with them into the adult world. And some of them are now in decision-making uh, positions. So the youth, number one. Two, this brain. This is what differs us most from chimpanzees and other animals who are way more intelligent than we thought, way more. But I mean, just think, think how we're speaking. We could be speaking to every country in the world just like this virtually. I mean, that, that's an amazing, it's just one example of what the human brain can do. And we are beginning to use it so that we can get away from all fossil fuels. We won't have to burn wood anymore because we're going to use the sun, the wind, the tide. And, um, you know, the next reason to hope is what we've already talked about, the resilience of nature, how nature can come back, even to reclaim places that we have totally destroyed and 
if we work with nature and if we change the way that we farm now, if we move back to small family farming and permaculture and uh, regenerative agriculture, and we eschew these monocultures and modern industrial farming, whether it be plants or animals. And then, you know, animal species on the brink of extinction can be given another chance and have been. And finally, there's what I call the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up, the people who fight for year after year to protect a piece of forest, to protect a species, and they suffer setbacks, but they don't give up. They say, no, we're going to, we're going to continue. And without hope, they won't continue. So having a feeling of hope to me is desperately important because why would you bother to go out and expend all your energy and sometimes all your money to do something to help if you didn't think it was going to help? You wouldn't bother. So we have to have hope, then we work harder, and that inspires others and gives them hope. So they work harder. And that's how it's going to have to be if we want a world that is, is habitable for our great great grandchildren. And if we don't change our ways after this pandemic, if we don't form a better relationship with the natural world and animals and a, a more sustainable greener economy, then it's going to be very bad for our great great grandchildren. Thank you so much, Jane. And thank you so much, Peter. Of course, stories are a huge part of helping raise awareness and giving us hope. Thank you both for your beautiful eloquence and books. And thank you for being here today. And I just add my thank you um, and my faith in the indomitable human spirit. And I wanna thank all the people behind the scenes who are working today also to make this possible. Lisette Mendez and her entire team at Miami Book Fair. Abby, Celso, Emily Cook, and Megan Jones, and just all my lovely bookseller friends and event coordinators from everywhere and their wonderful communities. Thank you for a beautiful, uplifting conversation. I have goosebumps as I say <laughs> this. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, books are on their way to you folks. Um, so thank you again and again. And um, Let's hope that we can preserve what we are, which is nature. Thank you for organizing it. And thank you for Peter to write, for writing this book and educating so many people about the wonders out there for us all to see if we only open our eyes and our hearts. I don't know about all of you, but I'm going outside yeah. <laughs> to, to do some tree hugging. Gonna go hug a tree. <laughs> right now. A tree. <laughs> Thank yeah, you thank all. You. Thank, thank you. you. I look thank out you. of the window thank here. I see well. the tree that I spent so many hours in as a child and I called him Beach and I made my grandmother leave Beach to me in her will. I mean, it was only a piece of paper. I wrote out a will, but she signed it. So. There is Beach. I can't climb him anymore. He's grown too big, but I eat my little sandwich underneath him and I'm joined by a robin and a blackbird. Oh. And so it's my one little break from all these Zooms and Skypes and interviews in the middle of the day. And I love it. I, I can encourage everyone to, to name a tree, to be, become friend to a tree because they are individuals. Yeah, right. they are definitely individuals. They're all different. Thank you very much. I was really happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Christina. And thank you very much, Jane. And I hope we meet in Beersofen in the Eiffel Mountains one day. No, we will. We will. We definitely will. You might have to come and see my forest in Gombe. Yeah. And, your, and your tree. <laughs> thank yeah. you, Maybe we'll everyone. get it back again. <laughs> thank you. Muchas gracias. Bye. Bye. Stay safe and be well. Bye. 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 Bye